Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the topics of Robert Sylvester Kelly and the relationship to the appeal process in the uh, Brooklyn trial and the Chicago area and what's going on with the pre-trial and everything that's going on. You're now listening to the August podcast because it's all about us in August. So today I want to share with you some things that are on the docket after we um, discuss the, you know, expert witness or expert doctor um, and what Bonjean had put down in the motion yesterday, then comes a new docket entry that was scheduled August 2nd, 2022. And the minute reads as follows. It's an entry before Honor, Honorable Harry Lionweber. And it was the video retrial conference. It was set for today. Um, well, by the time you see this, it will be pre recorded. So it will be, you know, yesterday at 9 a.m. And they told people that the persons that were granted remote access to proceedings are required to mute their lines upon entry. Persons found to have violated the prohibition against pho photographing, recording, and rebroadcasting of court proceedings may face sanctions, including removal of court-issued media credentials, restricted entry to future hearings, denial of entry to future hearings, and any other sanctions deemed necessary by the court, mailed noticed. Um, so the attention was brought to those who were listening to the, uh, the um, pre-trial. I did not get to see it. I did not get to listen to it. Uh, I do that on purpose because of the fact that I just do not wish to be considered um, as having recorded it. So I don't want to even be in the presence. But then comes the case file docket that I can speak about because this is public knowledge. So now we move into the second motion that was filed. And it was a nine page motion, United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, Eastern Division. U.S. versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, a.k.a. R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid, Milton Brown, and it's the government's motion to impanel a confidential jury. And this was submitted case number 19 CR 567. The Honorable Harry D. Lineweber. Due to the tremendous attention in this case from the media and other online platforms, the United States requests that a confidential jury be impaneled for trial. As set forth below, a confidential jury is necessary in this case to protect the jurors' privacy and integrity and to shield them from harassment by defendant Robert Sylvester Kelly's supporters. Now, you know here, we ain't, we ain't harassing nobody. We know how to get in touch with Bonjean. We know how to, you know, contact, um, the prosecution, we know how to do all that, but no one's doing that over here. So we're true supporters that's allowing the system to do as it does. And then from there, we'll take and talk about it in discussion and research and just put our opinions on the channel. That's as far as it needs to go, because this is not our case. This is Robert Sylvester Kelly's case. So the government requests that the following information about the jurors remain out of the public record until further order of the court. Because people don't went crazy, man. They don't went crazy. So yeah, the jurors are just someone who is there to do their civil duty and um, they should not be harassed. They should not be, you know, um, harassed or made to feel that they should be threatened. I know I wouldn't want to be in that position. Number one, juror's name. This is going to be out of the public record until further order of the court. The juror's name, the spouse's name, the juror's city of residence, and the juror's place of employment. Prior to filing this motion, this is footnote one, the government conferred with defendant's attorneys, defendants Kelly and McDavid opposed this motion. Defendant Brown takes no position. Number one, applicable law. So the public does not have an absolute right of access to jurors' names during a high-profile trial. U.S. versus Bagel Devish. 
Okay, as the Seventh Circuit has explained, the right question is not to whether names may be kept secret or disclosed deferred or disclosures deferred, but what justifies such a decision? Okay, so they want us to see the Northern District of Illinois' plan for random selection of jurors adopted by the Northern District of Illinois pursuant to U.S. Code. Okay, at paragraph 10a, expressly permitting district courts to maintain the confidentiality of jurors' names in the interest of justice. So they're trying to keep the peace. They're trying to make sure that individuals don't get hurt that people won't be trying to bomb up people's houses and different things like that. And it's totally, totally understandable. And um, so according to, let me see, because confidential juries infringe on the public nature of trials, they should only be used sparingly and after sound consideration that is articulated by the district court on the record, U.S. versus Harris. Accordingly, a judge must find some unusual risk to justify keeping jurors' names confidential. So there's been some a lot of stuff that has gone down since 2021, okay? And so they're trying to safeguard the jurors, and it's not that they're trying to, you know, do, I hope they're not trying to do a little underhanded thing to whereas, you know, because of the um, confidentiality, they're not going to be fair in, you know, during the jury selection, you know, hopefully it will be, you know, a, a spectrum of different individuals. So that will look at this in a fair and decent and legal way. Okay. So confidential jurors have been used in multiple high profile trials in this district. See U.S. versus Baglajevic, United States versus Black. In Baglajevic, for example, the district court explained that the case featured intense media scrutiny and unusually public statements by the defendant, and that the court had received several unsolicited communications from jurors regarding the trial. The court concluded that the presumption of disclosure was overcome because these circumstances made releasing jurors' names during trial uniquely risky. So they took the precedence Baklavetch and they used it and said that this is why we are not going to disclose the name of the jurors. Number two, footnote two, the plan is available at Northern District of Illinois website. See it if you want to follow that, but I'm not going to worry about that much. In black, Judge, St. Judge St. Eve concluded that similar factors supported her decision to prohibit access to jurors' names during trial. To disclose the juror's name in a high-profile trial such as this would create the unnecessary risk that during the course of the trial, jurors would be subjected to improper and presumptively prejudicial contact. Such contact creates the risk that the juror's verdict could rest on something other than the evidence admitted in this case. As recent history in this courthouse indicates, public disclosure of jury names during the pendency of a high-profile trial will increase the risk that external influences will be brought to bear on the jurors. Common sense further reveals that external influences will not be shouldered by the jurors alone, but will also bore by their families, friends, co-workers, and employers. These costs should not unnecessarily accompany the fulfillment of civic duty, especially where, like here, they create a real and substantial risk of compromising defendants' right to a fair trial. Second, to transform jurors' personal lives into public news, especially where several jurors have already indicated sensitivity to this issue. So right then and there, I don't know if they're going to be able to um, truly, you know, be, be non-biased in this situation, especially if they've already indicated sensitivity to this issue. So that should be a question. Could unnecessarily interfere with the jurors' ability or willingness to perform their sworn duties? This is black again. Number two, the argument. The national and international news coverage of this case has been extensive. Media outlets, bloggers, and video bloggers, vloggers, 
monitor the case docket closely and often repost the party's filings and the court orders within hours of appearing on the docket. Now, what I do is I give it a day or two. This was docketed 8-2. I'm just reporting it and recording it a day later. I try to give that access to the courts to get their information out. But um, this is footnote three. It says, um, R. Kelly's attorney challenges Chicago charges available at, um, at the link below. May 2nd, 2022, reporting on a motion to dismiss file by Kelly that day. R. Kelly Chicago trial remains set for August 1st as judge rejects delay. And that was today. The pretrial was on the 1st. So it was actually getting ready to take place. So defending Kelly is an international celebrity in the music industry between 96 and 2015. Kelly was nominated for over 250 music awards, including 26 Grammy awards. Kelly has a fervent fan base, including many individuals who actually use various social media platforms to share their opinions about Kelly and his ongoing criminal cases. The popularity of the docuseries Surviving R. Kelly, currently available on Netflix, shouldn't be, has also contributed to the widespread coverage of and the public interest in Kelly's criminal prosecutions. This is why they should have held that until after the trial, because it was, you know, it brought a lot of this chaos, the Surviving R. Kelly series. Defending Kelly's uh, jury trial in the Eastern District of New York, Indy, New York, conducted in 2021, also generated intense media attention. Uh, multiple major news outlets, including the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, posted daily articles, case during uh, the Indy case, during the trial and subsequent sentencing hearings. So it made it very difficult because, like he said, social media was going to get this stuff out, out there. You know what I mean? Um, so it says here, let me see where we at. Okay. Um, Defendant Kelly's jury trial in the Eastern District of New York in 2021 also generated intense media attention. In the Indy trial, the judge ordered the impaneling of an anonymous jury, a more restrictive remedy than a confidential jury due to the seriousness of the charges. The defendant's history of obstructing the judicial process, the, pot the potential for jury intimidation and the intensity of media attention given to this case. U.S. versus Kelly, case number 19, CR 286, um, Indy, October 8, 2020. So they're going to use his own case as his own precedence. As a result, the identifiers of all jurors, including their names, address, and place of employment, were withheld from the parties and the public in the Indy case. So they're trying to say that they were um, fearful of what could take place because of whatever they had read in the news or seen happen. Um, but I really and truly don't believe that, um, that they necessarily had to do that, but okay. We digress. We, you know, look at things as they are and we keep it moving. Since this case was charged in 2019, employees of the U S attorney's office have received numerous unsolicited emails and phone calls from individuals having no involvement in the case wanting to share their views about Kelly's prosecution. Now, I did one time send Jennifer Bonjean a, an email. In doing so, I wanted to have her on the show so she could clear up some of the discrepancies of the earlier parts of the case. And um, when she didn't return my call or my email, I figured she was busy and I'll get back to her whenever she gets back to me. So I never made an attempt to, you know, continue on because I understand she's, she's very, very busy. Indeed, defending Kelly included one such email chain in his recent discovery motion. Many of these unsolicited communications have come from Zelius Kelly supporters who wanted not only to express their views, but also to share social media content such as blog posts. Now, what I do is I send my information to federal attorneys, to judges that are not on this case, to 
you know, civic law groups to see how, you know, if they're, if they see any, any thing that I need to be concerned about, um, on this. And then I report it in other, um, in other videos, but as Judge Zago noted in Boglojevich, during the time leading up to trial, as well as during the trial, now this is in in this case right here, the judge for the Boglovich received several communications from opinionated members of the public, including emails, letters, phone calls, which were clearly an attempt to somehow influence the decision maker in this, this in this case. I really don't think it's an influence. I think it's a letter of care. Uh, character motion making sure that people understand who this person is like if you you know i'm here to say that i vouch for this person i believe that r kelly is a good person etc cetera, etc cetera. and so they got angry at that and didn't want it and it caused a havoc so while so many while some may be quick to discount a theorist and a forger it is highly likely that the jury would be disturbed that such people have been able to obtain their personal contact information. It is easy to see how contact like this could interfere with the juror's ability to perform his sworn duties. Now, I've never contacted a juror. I don't need to do that <laughs> at all. That has nothing to do with the appeal process. It's just the process of watching what's happening next, just like a football game, a tennis match, etc. As in Boglojevich, there have also been instances where individuals having no relation to this case have attempted to insert themselves into the proceedings by filing motions and letters on the docket. Wow, now that's going too far. Claiming to defend in Kelly, CR 151-5256-157, for example, defendant's expedited motion to dismiss criminal cause of action is a five-page document contending that the indictment was not properly returned in this case and the U.S. attorney was corrupt and acting out of fraud to deceive Mr. Kelly. Kelly's counsel at the time immediately filed a motion to strike the filing stating that none of these documents were prepared by Mr. Kelly. They were not filed with his approval, nor were they filed with the approval of his attorney. They are plainly legally incorrect, frivolous, and full of errors. R-153, see Boglovich, um, noting that the file of uninvited amicus brief asserting a massive government conspiracy and commenting and commenting that the extraordinary attention being paid to this case leads not only to the expression of opinions, but also to the view that the trial is an opportunity to be noticed. The extreme degree of public interest and the actions of persons interested in interjecting themselves into the proceedings is also illustrated by telephone court proceedings, including routine status hearings conducted by court. Hundreds of individuals regularly phone in to observe these proceedings, and in some instances, members of the public have become unruly and yelled expletives at one another as court proceedings were being conducted. Now, that's why I do will not go on a video call, conference call, telephone call, because those names, numbers, and everything that is attached to that is docketed, even if you say nothing on that phone. For example, during a telephone status hearing, May 10th, 2022, so y'all know that we're going to bring that up. After the court denied Kelly's motion to continue the trial date, multiple members of the public opinion openly criticized the court's decision. The government was later informed that one of the attendees on the call recorded the proceedings and posted the audio recording on the internet. Moreover, federal prosecutions of Kelly have given rise to threats of violence directed at prosecutors and witnesses. For example, on July 12, 2022, a federal grand jury returned an indictment charged Christopher Gunn with threatening the lives of three individuals involved in the prosecution of Kelly and Indy. So United States versus Gunn, July 12, 2022. As alleged in the complaint, now mind you, this is why I say keep your head. This is all an observational study for us to research, analyze, dissect on the channel and give our opinions here. This is a place where you can lay your burdens down and speak your truth 
but you have to do it in a decent and ordered way. Gunn is active on various social media platforms and regularly posted about Kelly's cases, including Gunn's desire to storm the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, attached here to as Government Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1, I'm going to be going over the exhibit tomorrow. As another example, one of Kelly's supporters, Donnell Russell, recently pleaded guilty to interstate stalking for his participation in the scheme to harass, intimidate, and cause substantial emotional distress to one of the victim witnesses in the Indy prosecution. Wow, they certainly know how to put this thing together. Um, again, I'm waiting for that sentence for Donnell Russell, because based on the time that he receives for this, it's gonna be a determinant of whether they really gave him immunity to speak on behalf of what he had done. But, here we go, back to this. In sum, this case has generated extraordinary media attention and such attention is likely to lead to third party attempts to contact and influence jurors. And the anticipation of such contacts, making it difficult for jurors to follow the court's instructions, particularly instructions barring outside research and discussion of the case, and to evaluate the evidence impartially. Such actions would no doubt also impede efforts to find people willing to serve on juries in highly publicized cases. The risk of outside influence is neither hypo hypothetical nor speculative. Here is, in this already, here it has already come to fruition during pretrial proceedings. Indeed, the circumstances of this case arguably weigh in favor of impaneling an anonymous rather than a confidential jury. See United States versus Mansouri, 303. Finding anonymous jury wanted, warranted based on previous attempts to interfere with the judicial process. The severity of the punishment that the defendant would face if convicted and, what, and whether publicity regarding the case presents the prospect that the jurors' names could become public and expose them to intimidation and harassment. However, because the chief concern in this case is the likelihood that jurors would be subjected to extra judicial contracts by members of the media and the public, in the government's view, impaneling a confidential jury is the appropriate and least restrictive means of ensuring that the defendants receive a fair trial by an impartial jury free from outside influences. Moreover, there are no alternative means such as courtroom security or cautionary instructions capable of achieving satisfactory protection. Here, potential extrajudicial contacts and influences may be delivered in secret or over the internet and may emanate from places from beyond the district court's jurisdiction. Accordingly, given the enormous and extraordinary national and international media interest in this case, and the extraordinary risk of external contacts and influence that interest creates, impanelment of a confidential jury is required in the interest of justice. So three, the conclusion. For all the reasons set forth above, the court should grant the government's motion to impanel a confidential jury in this case. Respectfully, John R. Losh, Jr., United States Attorney for um, Elizabeth Pozzolo, Janice Apeting, Elizabeth Pozzolo, Jason Julian, Brian Williamson, Assistant U.S. Attorneys, 219 South Dearborn Street, Room 500, Chicago, Illinois, 60604. And the telephone number is 312-353-5300, dated August 2nd, 2022. Now, this is not for y'all to go calling them people and, you know, acting anonymous, doing crazy Donnell Russell type stuff. Mm -mm. This is for you to talk and discuss this among ourselves. Now, mind you, it's amazing. We must, I'm, I'm going to talk now for you to share your views on the live um, portion of this premiere. I've had to go straight premiere in order to make sure I'm heard effectively without buffering and without other issues that would stop you from being able to stay focused. Um, 
there's either a lot of things going on on YouTube or I am, you know, um, I don't know what's happening, but I'm just going to assume that a lot of things are going on on YouTube. I'm not assuming nothing else. So the point that I want to make is the comments will be disabled after the live uh, premiere. So I'm going to talk a little bit for you to get your points across. I feel that the jury should be protected because of the things that the public has done. The public has done some crazy, crazy things. And I was going to do read the exhibit tomorrow, but I think I am only at 23 minutes. So let me hit this. Uh, let me get this other. Um, let me see where that other. Let me find the other um, brief here. Okay, so let me see how long it is before I go into it. It's 90 degrees over here and it's so hot. <laughs> Even with air on, it's just extremely hot. So let me see, exhibit one, we have 12 pages. Let me get to something. So it's to the clerk's office, United States District Court, Eastern District of New York. Um, application for leave to uh, was submitted to the USAO Indy. Let me see here. I have um, some really rude neighbors. I'm, I do apologize for the loud noise. That's senseless, really senseless. So the Eastern District of New York, Ryan Chabot being duly sworn to deposes and states that he is a special agent with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigation, duly appointed according to law and acting as such. On or about October 4th, 2021, in the Eastern District of New York and elsewhere, Christopher Gunn knowingly and intentionally transmitted an interstate and foreign commerce communications containing threats to injure the person of another, to wit threats that would result in the death of seriously bodily injury of Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, and Jane Doe 3, whose identities are known to the affiant. Under Title 18, U.S. Code Section 875C. So the source of your deponent's informant information and the grounds for his belief are as follows. One, so they have a footnote let me see what it is because the purpose of this complaint is to set forth only those facts necessary to establish probable cause to arrest I have not described all the relevant facts and circumstances of which I am aware this was filed 8 2 August the 2nd so I am a special agent with the US Department of Homeland Security investigation and have been since October 2017. I am currently assigned to New York field office and more specifically to a squad that investigates human trafficking. I am responsible for conducting and assisting in investigations into the activities of individuals and criminal groups responsible for sex trafficking and related offenses. I have had significant training and experience investigating a wide range of crimes involving violence and threats of violence, including threats made by telephone, online, and through other electronic means. I am familiar with the facts and circumstances set forth below from my participation in, in the investigation. My review of the investigative file, including the defendant's criminal history re record, and from reports of other law enforcement officers involved in the investigation. Unless specifically indicated, all conversation and statements described in this affidavit are related in some, in substance, and in part only. Number two, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York and New York Field Office have been investigating Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as R. Kelly, here, here and after Kelly, and others for their participation in the racketeering enterprise involving, among other things, bribery, extortion, the production of child pornography, transportation of women and girls across state lines to engage in illegal 
sex activity, including sexual contact with individuals who were too young to consent to such activity under state law and failure to notify sexual partners of sexually transmitted disease prior to engaging in sexual intercourse in violation of state law and related substantive evidence and for arranging for travel in interstate commerce with intent to promote, manage, establish, and carry on an extortion in violation of state law. Number three, on September 27, 2021, Kelly was convicted in the U.S. District Court of Eastern District of New York following a jury trial of racketeering involving uh, predicate racketeering, active bribery, sexual exploitation, forced labor, and man act violations of Jane Doe 1, 2, 3, served as assistant U.S. state attorneys responsible for the federal prosecution of Kelly in the above captioned matter. Kelly is scheduled to be sentenced June 29, 2022. Number four, the defendant Christopher Gunn is a re resident of Bolingbrook, Illinois. On the internet, Gunn uses the alias Deboski Gunn and Deboski to post content to various social media accounts. Number five, as of at least September 21, the defendant Christopher Gunn was aware of the federal investigation and prosecution of Kelly and discussed that investigation and prosecution in various social media contacts. On September 3rd, 2021, records from the U.S. D District Court of Eastern District of New York indicate that Christopher Gunn signed an overflow courtroom attendance log to publicly view the trial of Kelly. Christopher Gunn provided a telephone number ending in 1345 and the 1345 number. Open source and law enforcement database search confirmed the 1345 number belonged to Gunn. Number six, on or about October 4th, 2021, the defendant Christopher Gunn narrated a video titled Get, titled Get Real Familiar, the video, which was live streamed on YouTube on the Dabowski's Gunn YouTube account which belongs to Gunn. The video features a male voice, the male voice who, for the reason stated below, I have identified as Gunn, relating the following message. I quote, I want y'all to get real familiar with this building. I'm about to pull up and show to you. I'm gonna show you exactly where we're going to be going. And we're going to get real familiar with this building. And this building is gonna get real familiar with the enterprise, also known as Kel's steppers. We know who is going to stick to everything that I told you, which is that if Kel's go down, everyone goes down, end quote. I believe that the reference to Kel, Kel's is in reference to Kelly. So um, footnote number two, the transcripts contained in this affidavit are in, in draft form and are subject to pre-revision. Moreover, the entry of each exception excerpt has not been transcribed. Okay. I believe that the reference to Kells is a reference to Kelly. Number seven, approximately two minutes into the video, the defendant Christopher Gunn states in sum and substance and in relevant part, you quote, you see this building right here. That building is located right outside the courthouse where R. Kelly was being prosecuted at. It's the first building on the corner. That is the United States Federal Prosecution Office, end quote. Gunn then displayed a photograph of the location on Cabin Plaza East in Brooklyn, New York, the photograph, which I know to be the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York. A Google search box, which reads U.S. Attorney Eastern District New York Office, is displayed in the video above the photograph. Eight, in the video, while the photograph is on the screen, the defendant Christopher Gunn states, in some in substance and in relevant part, quote, that's where they at. That's where they work at. We're going to storm their office. We're going to storm their office. We're going to storm Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 2, and Jane Doe 3. We're going to storm their office, end quote. Now, couldn't that have been, we're going to go in and rally. We're going to go in and who said that that was a threat? I mean, I don't see it. You know, I mean, storm, you know, it might be, I don't know, but it doesn't sound like, you know. Well, anyway, the defendant, Christopher Gunn, further states, if you ain't got the stomach for the shit we about to do, I'm asking that you just bail out. Oh, quote, end quote. Okay. 
See, I didn't know that part. <laughs> Shortly after Gunn shares a video containing a scene from the 91 crime drama Boys in the Hood, in the scene, four males ride in the vehicle. One of the males begins to load a firearm, and one of the males asks to be let out of the vehicle. The sound of a gunshot being fired can be heard. Number nine, individual one, whose identity is known to me and who has known the defendant Christopher Gunn for several years, he reviewed the video and identified the male voice as Gunn. In addition, I have reviewed the video in other publicly available social media video posting made by Gunn and Gunn's voice as captured in other publicly available social media video postings closely resembles the male voice captured in the video. Additionally, the video depicts a profile photograph of Gunn and the Dubowski Gunn username, which Gunn has publicly identified as his own. 10. Furthermore, a law enforcement analysis of Gunn's social media accounts have identified information, which I believe, based on my training, experience, and participation in this investigation, to be a reference to Gunn's affiliation with the Kelly case. For example, on or about April 15, 2022, Gunn narr narrated a YouTube live video titled R. Kelly Propaganda Part 46, Who is Ann Donnelly and What's Up with Nature Boy Cash Out on the Dubosky Channel YouTube account. The video includes the hashtag Free R. Kelly, hashtag Ann Donnelly, and hashtag Kel Steppers. Okay, Steppers is three. Here's the footnote. In the con context of internet activity, a hashtag is a word or phrase preceded by the symbol hashtag that classifies or characterizes, excuse me, the accompanying text, such as a tweet, such as a tweet. Let me get something to drink. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> I'm telling you, I've been doing these readings for the last, like, three hours. <laughs> On or about June 24, 2020, the defendant posted the following message using his Dubosky YouTube account. Hashtag to Enterprise, I have a spot for us all. Sick to link during the trial. See you there. A YouTube user comments, cool, free R. Kelly, and another YouTube comments in some in substance in part man please free r kelly based on my training experience and participation in the um investigation as well as the timing and context of the conversation i believe gunn is referring to kelly supporters the enterprise r kelly uh robert sylvester kelly indicating he has location within the eastern district of new york for kelly supporters to gather during the upcoming kelly situation scheduled for june 29th 2022 i have a spot for us all sick to the link during the trial and three declaring that he will be present in the eastern district of new york at the time see you there 12 an analysis of records from square inc managers of the mobile payment application cash app reveals approximately eight transactions between february 26 and june 1 2022 which based on the investigation to date indicates the defendant christopher gunn engaged in the sale of firearm ammunition in relation to the Kelly matter. For example, on or about February 26, 2021, a Cash App user paid Gun $20 for 30 rounds on the haters. Um, on or about August 22, 2021, a Cash App user paid Gun $20 for 30 rounds for our Kelly. On June 1, a cash shop user paid gun 15 for 30 rounds. Based on my training experience and participation in this investigation, I believe the reference to rounds to be a reference to fire ammunition. This has nothing to do with R. Kelly. He is locked up, and I know that Global Tell Link is literally monitoring every single thing that has been done on that phone. So wherefore your Deponent respectfully requests an arrest warrant for the defendant Christopher Gunn, also known as Dubosky Gunn and Dubosky, so that he may be dealt with accordingly to the law. I further request that the court issue an order sealing under further order of the court <clears throat> all papers submitted in support of this application, 
including the affidavit and arrest warrant based upon my training and experience. I have learned that criminals actively search for criminal affidavits and arrest warrants via the internet. Therefore, premature disclosure of the contents of this affidavit and related documents will seriously jeopardize the investigation, including by giving the defendant an opportunity to flee or continue flight from prosecution, destroy or tamper with evidence and change patterns of behavior. Digitally, digitally signed by Ryan Chabot on June 25th, 2022. Special Agent U.S. Department of Homeland Security sworn to be for me by telephone this 25th day of 2022. The Honorable Robert M. Levy, U.S. Magistrate Judge, Eastern District of New York. So I wanted to share that with you as well. So I hope you were able to follow that and give your live comments while we're here on the actual channel because I will be disabling the comments because it's just what I do. When we have our lives, my major people from R. Kelly Appeal will be on our channel. And I'm really not trying to even take any, you know, anybody else's comments that have not been a part of R. Kelly Appeal TV. This thing is really getting technical. And this is the social media aspect that Robert Sylvester Kelly was telling us about. So we're updated on the motions. Everything that has been filed up until this point has been discussed on the channel. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. I do apologize for not being able to be live with you. I really don't want to do that right now because it's just a headache for me. You know, it's a headache to do the research as well as report the research and then organize it. And then I have to deal with buffering issues and all that. It's just, that's not it. That's not what I do. So I thank you for so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. And let me know how you feel about the good morning conversations that we have on our Kelly Appeal TV for August, because the August podcast is what? All about who? Let's see. Let's see if you guys have been listening. So thank you so much for being here. Thank all my um, supporters who are part of the R. Kelly Appeal TV, the powerful names that come through, that give support, that share their journey, that share what they feel. Um, but again, let's keep it as balanced as we can because I'm sure that Robert Sylvester Kelly would not want us to be trying to get in there with him when he's trying to get out here with us. So it just makes sense to just be honorable and respectful to how the system is running its thing. Because as many of our supporters will say, God got this and God sees all. He sits high and looks low, okay? My God is not a man, but you know, um, my energy, my energy of what I believe in you know, sits high and looks low. And so we just have to be ready for that. And so I thank you so much for being a part of our Kelly Appeal TV. I will definitely keep you posted. I may go live every now and again just to see how the system is working with us. But um, so you might see me out there. So give me a shout out, give me a holler. And um, yeah, if you really need to talk to me about something, please email me at scales to success LLC at gmail.com. That's scales to success at gmail.com. That way we can have a conversation and then we can discuss it, you know, to the point where we can get through this. You know, if you're really, really dealing with something and you don't know which way to go as far as, you know, how to handle it or, you know, whatever, um, we're here and I think I'm equipped enough to be able to mentally help you handle what you're hearing and, you know, maybe emotionally how to kind of shut everything down and just become one with yourself. And that's what this is all about. Building the character to know that we are the chosen. We are the chosen based at this time to be part of what we believe in. 
So it's about what we believe in and also balancing what we see happening and how we handle the emotions of that, what we see. So with that, uh, thank you again. And please join me um, when, when you see, hit the subscribe button. So when I upload something or go live, you will be the first to be there. I am still getting our members page set up so we can really, really alleviate all the riffraff, you know what I mean? The, the, you know, negative stuff, but yeah. So as always, keep it 100. Thank you so very much for being here and we'll see you next time.